I don't know about you guys, again, in case if you didn't know, and in case, uh, again, you haven't figured it out yet, it is Father's Day. So we are happy to say Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room, all the fathers watching online, um, and again, just all fathers everywhere. And again, it's, a, it's an awesome day that we can celebrate um, just the work that you do, the celebration, um, again, of the sacrifice that you made. And we'll kind of dive a little bit into uh, of what some of that means as we get into the message here in just a second. But um, I kind of want to go over a, a Gallup poll that was taken late in December of 2021. Um, there are just certain jobs, certain professions, you could say, that uh, just kind of lean themselves towards requiring more trust. And so they, they asked a question basically stating, um, which of these jobs do you find to be honest and ethical? That was essentially the main push that they were asking. Like, what jobs do you find? And they listed out 22 different ones, and they were allowed to check anywhere from, well, very, very trustworthy to very, very untrustworthy, right? And so they had those options kind of picked between and coming in at number one was actually nurses. Nurses across the U.S., again, this was 811 people all across the U.S. and all kinds of different uh, socioeconomic uh, platforms all across. Um, again, out of those people, 81% of them said they very, very much trust nurses. In fact, again, that's kind of just a testament to the nurses that we have here in the room, as well as, again, anybody who may be watching. Uh, but again, even more to that credit is this is actually the 20th year in a row that they've maintained that number one position. So again, just kind of kudos to them. But coming in in number two was medical doctors. Number three was grade school teachers. Number four was pharmacists. And number five are military officers. And it's just kind of interesting looking at those top five in particular. Again, it keeps, you can keep going down the rabbit trail and just seeing all the numbers and so forth. But I just found it just looking at just those top five of those five, three of them are in the healthcare profession, right? Three of them are, are people who you want to trust to make sure that we're living healthy lives, that we're physically doing everything that we need to be doing. And again, if you're a nurse caring for somebody in the hospital or at home, we want to trust that you're there to actually help us. If you're a doctor interpreting our exams, interpreting our scans, um, there to give us an exam, we want to trust that the advice you're giving to us is, again, for our betterment, to make us healthier, to help us, again, live longer lives, essentially. And if you're a pharmacist, again, we're, we're trusting that the medication that you put into the bottles that we're going to take are, are ones, the correct ones to begin with, and again, ones that ultimately can help us in our health. But all of these professions all have an element of trust to them, right? They're all ones that you, you have to trust, but you can also see and verify that trust, right? You can see whether or not the nurse is giving you proper care. You can tell if they actually care about you or if they don't care about you. You can tell if the doctor really knows what they're talking about or if it sounds like they're trying to make it up and they're, they're kind of pulling things off the cuff. You can see the pills once the pharmacist gives them to you. You can open them up. You can look them up online and make sure, like, does this pill match what it's supposed to look like? Or did I get something wrong? All of these, again, they have a sense of trust with them, but they're also a sense that you can verify. And again, if you don't like your nurse, you can ask for another one. If you don't like your doctor, you can go get a second opinion. If you don't like your pharmacist, again, you just go to a different one. But how many professions can you say, if you just went with it, you can just trust them? full-blown, like there's, there's no need to verify, there's no need to check. You can just say like, well, you did this work, good with me. I don't even need to look at it. I'm going to pay you. We're good to go. Like for me, I, like, I, I can't really think of any. Like every profession that I can think of is one that I want to trust, but I want to verify. Like if I get something done in my car, I'm driving, I'm seeing like, was the work done? Like does my car feel like it's running smoother? You know, if, if something is done to our house, you're looking at it and seeing like, how was that repair done? Does, is it working better than it was before? And again, honestly, I can't really think of one that you, that I can at least, where you can say like the work was done, I trust them, I don't need to verify, it's 100% like they're good to go. Like all of them require some kind of, again, faith by seeing it happen essentially. And again, in case if you miss the signs and miss the projectors, again, it is Father's Day and we're celebrating that here this morning. And I want to focus on a story looking at somebody who does this very thing, a father who trusts Jesus before even seeing the results and everything happening. That he hears Jesus make him a promise and he says yes and amen and he goes forth and he does it. Without having any proof, he takes him at his word. And it's through this father that I want to look at three characteristics that make up what a godly father should be. And so if you have your Bibles or your devices, we're going to be in John chapter 4. 
John chapter 4. And if you're new to church and everything and you're not really sure what that is, again, if you have a paper book, you're turning about two-thirds of the way in. You'll find the New Testament or the Christian Bible, and it's going to be the fourth book. If you see a bunch of Hebrew names, just keep going. It's, it's quite a bit of ways in there. But you're looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the fourth book there in the New Testament is John. If you're on a device, just type it in and you'll be fine. We'll make it there. So with that, let me go and read again. We're going to start in verse 46, and this is one of those passages where they actually lay out a little bit of the background for us. So let's hear what uh, John has written to us and how we kind of see, again, three characteristics of a godly father. So verse 46, it says, So he, and this is Jesus, he came again to Canaan in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. So again, there's, in this one verse, there's a lot of background that we need to unpack here. Again, this first sentence tells us, again, John is returning to Canaan, from to Canaan in Galilee. Again, if you're not really sure how this works out, Canaan is just a small region within Galilee. It'd be the same as me saying, like, well, I grew up in Aleph, which is a small region in Houston. Right? So, same idea. You're from Canaan in Galilee. I'm from Aleph in Houston. Same kind of setup here. But not only is John giving us a geographical note, but he's also giving us a theological one. He tells us not only where Jesus is going, but he's telling us what happened last time he was here. He tells us that this is where Jesus performed his first miracle, where he turned water into wine. Again, for those who aren't completely familiar, just recapping very quickly, Jesus attends a wedding with his family, and it's during the wedding that the wine runs out. And this may not seem like that big. It's an issue, even in today, if your alcohol runs out at the party, you're kind of like, eee, that sinks. But you're not like, well, the wedding's over. But in those times, this would have been like a gigantic faux pas, right? This would have been something societally unacceptable. And so Jesus comes in and his mother comes to him and says, like, Jesus, do something about it. And so he comes and he takes six jars of water and the water is used for washing hands. It's not like clean water. It's not even good water. It's dirty water. And he turns it into the best wine that any of the guests have ever drank. And so it's here that the people in Canaan, they would have known about Jesus. They knew that he had performed this miracle. They knew of who he was and how he did this miraculous thing. And so they would have all been flocking to see him and all wanting to see what Jesus would have done next as he returns back to Canaan. And then in the back half of this verse, we read that then in Capernaum, there's an official whose son was ill. Now, Capernaum, again, is about 15 to 20 miles away from Canaan. To put that in perspective, if you were leaving from right here at our church here in West Houston, if you go south, it's about Sugar Land, give or take. If you're going north, it's about Willowbrook, give or take. Depending on what road you may go, you may get a little bit more, a little bit less. But that's about the distance we're looking at here. Other than that, we don't know anything about this, about this uh, official. Like some say in Luke or in Acts, he might be this particular gentleman. Some say he might be this other gentleman. Official, we don't know. Like he's just an official. We don't even know like what position he has. Is he like a centurion? Is he somebody high up in, in the rankings? Or is he just like a minor person who just takes care of paperwork? All we know is that he's an official. He works for the government. That's all that we know about this guy. And we also know that, again, his son is very sick. So with all of that, that leads us into the first thing that I think a father does for his, uh, for, for, as a godly father in this case. So let's look at verse 37, and it tells us the first characteristic that I want to dive into. And so it says, when this man, the official in this case, heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. I think, again, seeing how this official acts, it tells us, again, the first characteristic of a godly father, that a godly father loves his family. A godly father will go above and beyond to love and to serve his family. Again, looking back at verse 47, we see that the official, he heard that Jesus was coming back. Right? So it's not like he had planned this trip. It's not like he had anticipated, like, I'm going to travel to Canaan this weekend or anything like that. And again, remember that Capernaum is about 15 to 20 miles. And for some of us, you may not think like, ah, that doesn't seem that big of a deal. And again, that's because we have cars. And again, some of you may have made that trip today. You're like, well, I came from Sugar Land to here. So it's uh, it's about 30 minutes. Now for, again, on horseback even, this would have been a good day's travel, like a good 24 hours to make it over here. And so for the official, he's leaving everything behind. More importantly, again, this father, he's dropping all other responsibilities, all other appointments, all other things that he has to take care of. He's saying that all is secondary compared to taking care of my son who is now sick. 
He doesn't care what else he has to do. He doesn't care what other appointments he has to let go of and drop and say, I'm sorry, I can't be there. I've got to go. He makes the commitment. He makes the sacrifice and he leaves immediately to catch up so he can ask Jesus this one very important question. Now on the screen here, I have the ESV and it says he went to him and asked him to come down. And that's very much an accurate translation. But the part that's kind of missing when you look at the original Greek language, this word, this verb, asked, that's written there, that's actually in the imperfect tense. And again, that's not something we, we translate well here in the English language. And so imperfect tense is, is a past tense that hasn't been finished yet. And so again, you could also translate this, and there's a reason why they don't, because it just doesn't make sense this way, but you could say it, he went and he asked him, and he asked him again, and he asked him again, and he kept on asking him, because he never stops asking, essentially. Like this official, he is begging Jesus to come down. He's not just saying like, hey, but would, would you, could you make it down here? No, he's like, please, Jesus, would you come down? I'm asking you again and again, would you come down and heal my son? Again, this is an official, whether in the minor courts or whether all the way up, he's an official. He's somebody of importance in the government. He's somebody of importance in society. And he says, I don't care. I don't care what I look like. I don't care if I'm begging. I don't care what people think about me. I don't care about my reputation. All that matters right now is I am sacrificing for my son. I am saying, please, Jesus, would you come down and would you heal my son? In a similar sense, I read a story that I felt reminded me of this while I was studying through this. And it's about a man named Diego Ramirez. And Diego, he lives in the highlands of Guatemala with his three daughters. And he's been raising his three daughters for the last 10 years because his mother is out of the picture. They didn't go into why. I don't think that was as important. But he works all day long, all seven days of the week, so that he can provide for their physical needs. They have close to where they have food to eat, they have water to drink. But then he spends all night sewing and embroidering for them. It's when he puts his daughters to bed that he goes to work on his own personal job that he has. See, in the Mayan culture in Guatemala, it's traditional for mothers to make their daughters something called a huplio, if I've said that right at all. And again, if you're from Guatemala, if you know how to pronounce that better than I do, that's okay. Don't get mad at me. I'm just trying. It's called H-U-I-P-I-O, huplio. And it's this special blouse, as you can see, I put up on the screen. They're very intricate. They have bright colors. There's beads. But there's, each, each one of them is unique. No one is the same as the other. And that's because the mother, as she makes this, she weaves into it. She embroiders into it. She beads into it special designs that, that are unique to that individual person, that are unique to that individual family, that, that represent, again, just who they are and the family that they live in. And so this man, Diego, not having a wife to do this, he comes down and he makes these for his daughter, for his three daughters. And it's not like you just make one and you're done. No, you, you have a set that you kind of go through. So each one of these, he says, takes roughly 20 to 30 hours that he's embroidering by hand because there's no other way for him to do it. And you would think like, oh, that's kind of cool. Like that seems really nice for him to do. But in the society, again, this is seen as a woman's only job. And so as the other men see him do this, they tend to make fun of him and they poke jokes at him. And they, they, they think of him as just lesser because he's doing, again, in their terms, like he's doing a woman's job. But ultimately, he continues doing this over and over and over because he doesn't want his daughters to feel left out. He doesn't want his daughters to feel like they're missing something when they go into school, when they go into the village. They can be just like the other girls. And he says, and I'm quoting from him, it's all worth it to see their happiness and to give them opportunities that I never had. I think Diego, again, is just emulating what this official does. Right? That the official, he comes here and he says, I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people are going to say about me. I care that my son needs to be healed. And I think again, Diego does the same thing for his daughters. I don't care what people think about me as I embroider. I don't care what people say about who I am. I care about my daughter's happiness. I care about what they need in this world. And Jesus is, is going to answer and to respond to me here in just a second. So as followers of Christ, again, I think the first thing that we see as godly fathers, the first characteristic we look at is that we are to love our family. And so looking at the second one, let's look at verses 48 through 50 here. And it says, so Jesus replying to the official, Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. 
The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. I think the second characteristic that we see here is that a godly father is one who is filled with faith. And a godly father is one who lives, again, not by what he sees, but by his faith in Jesus Christ. Again, jumping back to verse 48, it says, Jesus said to him, unless you see these signs and wonders, you will not believe. And again, this seems a little odd. It seems actually even a little harsh, and it, it kind of is to a certain extent. But when reading this, it's, it's like Jesus is snapping back at this guy. This guy's coming and saying, Jesus, would you heal my son? And he says, unless I do these miracles, unless I do these wondrous things, like you would not believe in who I am. It'd be like if somebody came up to you and they're like, hey, I heard there was free food around here. And you were like, if there was free food, I'd be eating it right now. You're, like, you're, you're kind of like retorting it. You're kind of making fun of them in that comment. That's the kind of vibe that we get when we read through this here. But remember the situation that Jesus is entering into Canaan. That he's coming here and people are flocking to him because they're, they're looking for the next miracle. They're looking to see what is Jesus going to do next. Right? It's like a celebrity. It's like a, a sports team that just won the championship. They're fair weather fans. They're, they're crowding around. They're seeing like, hey, he just did something awesome. Let's wait and see like, what's the next major thing he's going to do. Because we know in the end, when he is crucified, they all run away. They're not people who are staying, who are devoted to Christ. And so he's saying, like, unless you see me do these things, I'm not here to be your entertainer. I'm not here to be somebody just to perform these miracles at your whim. He's saying, unless you see these signs, you won't believe who I am. And so Jesus makes this response to the official, and the official responds back to him, and he just says one very important phrase. And, and really, what Jesus is asking when he's, ask, when he's making this statement, he's really pushing back on the official, and he's telling him, do you actually believe who I am, or do you believe what I can do for you? Right? Do you believe that I am Christ, the Son of God, or do you just want a miracle to happen? And so in verse 49, the, re the official responds to him, and he says, Sir, come down before my child dies. And in reading this, it just, seems like, it just seems like he just repeated himself. Like, why didn't he make up an argument? Why didn't he push back and say, like, no, I truly believe in you. I, like, I beg you, please. No. It, it just, this man at this point is at desperation. Right? He has nothing left. He has no argument. He has no justification for himself. He has no reason to persuade Jesus. So he just, again, simply begs, sir, would you come down before my child dies? But I think what's important in that phrasing here is that the official isn't asking, Jesus, would you come down and possibly save my son? Like, Jesus, if you could save my son, would you come down? Like, he's lacking those qualifiers of faith. He's making a faith statement even in this. He is trusting that Jesus is who he is. He's trusting the miracles that Jesus can do. He's trusting in who Jesus is and saying, I trust you enough that I want you to come heal my son. It's, would you come to heal my son? Now, if it's possible, would you come to heal my son? Because the difference here is hoping that Jesus can do something versus knowing that Jesus can do something are two completely different things. And then finally, in verse 50, we have this response from Jesus. And he says, go, your son will live. And I think that's an incredible statement in and of itself. That's a miracle by itself that Jesus says, go and your son is healed. But as a regular human being, I find the back half of that even more shocking. Because the man takes him at his word. Right? He just ups and leaves. He says, okay, Jesus said it. I'm going to go. I wasn't sure if I wanted to make this joke or not. But it's, I heard it from one of the other pastors as I'm just reading and listening and, and kind of diving into this passage. And they made a joke saying, like, it'd be like you go to the store. Your wife sends you to the grocery store. And you're like, hey, pick up sugar. And you forget the sugar. And they're like, you had one job. You just needed to pick up sugar. That's all I was asking for. Right? I can imagine his wife, he gets back to his home and she's like, where's Jesus? Like you had one job, go get Jesus. And you come back and nothing. Right? The other believers, the official rather, the official believes the words of Jesus and he just goes home. Right? I can't even imagine the faith that this official has. The first, he trusts that Jesus is capable of healing his son. Not if it's possible, but he knows you can heal my son. And then second, he trusts that Jesus doesn't even need to be in the same room, let alone the same city, in order for him to heal his son. Like, I would hope in this situation, if this were happening, if I came up to Jesus and he told me this, I would hope that I would respond the same way. But just knowing how I am, knowing who I am, like, I don't think I would. 
Like if Jesus said, go, your daughter will be healed for me and Mike's situation with my daughter Olivia. He said, go and Olivia will be healed. I'd be like, I trust you, but can you just come just in case? Like, you know, in, in case if I get there and she's, she just happens to not be well, like then you can heal her again. You know, like I trust you, but again, I want to verify. I want to see that this is actually happening. Can you, can you come and just, just make sure, just to double check, just to play it safe. Can you come? Because I don't have the faith that this official had. But again, we get the complete opposite reaction from this official, right? He says, Jesus says his son is healed and he trusts him. He is filled with faith from the very beginning, saying that I believe that you can do this and I believe that you have done this. And so he goes home. He goes on his way. And so for the last thing here, we look towards verse 51 through 54 to see the last characteristic of a godly father. And he raised for us, and he was going down. He, again, now is the centurion. And his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. And so he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. I think the last characteristic we see in this passage here is that a godly father is one who puts his faith into action. A godly father isn't one who just sits idly by, but instead he he leads his family into faith. And looking back at verse 51 here, we see that again, the official is now, he's heading home. He meets his servants along the way and they tell him his son is doing better. And I would imagine that again, this must be like one of the happiest moments for the official. That he's ecstatic to hear, my son is now healed. He was at the brink of death and now it's made a giant turnaround. So he must be ecstatic beyond all things. But then in 52, we read again his response. He suddenly just realizes like, hey, like when did he start to get better? Like when did things start to improve? And his servants tell him it was yesterday at the seventh hour, which would have been 1 p.m. for us translating. And then he realizes in 53, that's when Jesus told me my son will live. At 1 p.m. the day before, that's when Jesus said, your son will live. I think a couple things to point out here. I think first, it again, is that faith is not trusting, again, what you see. But it's trusting in Christ despite not even seeing him. It's relying on Jesus, even though we actually haven't met him. It's hearing stories like this in the Bible. It's hearing stories like this from people who walked with Jesus for years on end. And knew that he was capable of doing miracles. And he's still capable of doing miracles to this very day. So again, I think the first thing that we see again is is trusting in Christ. Is seeing without believing. Is having faith despite not seeing. And I think the second thing that we see here is that sometimes our prayers aren't answered in the time that we want. Right? Ideally, if this official did the things the way that he wanted to, they would have left. They would have gone to his home. He would have had, his, he would have had Jesus heal his son, and he would have seen it happen that very moment. But instead, Jesus says, your son is healed. He takes him at his word, and it's at least a day until he finds out his son is better. Again, people argue over the timing of all this. We have no idea officially how much time. Did he spend the night and rest after traveling all night and then decide to leave the next morning at the break of dawn? Did he leave that very day and it still took 24 hours so he caught them sometime? We have no idea. All we know is at least a day passed and his prayer was answered. It wasn't answered when he found his son. It was answered when Jesus made it happen. And so I think that's important for us to take note of. There are prayers may be answered in ways that we don't know. There are prayers may be answered, that you may pray something today, and it's answered in a way. You won't find out that that prayer was answered until next year, until next month, until next week, until whenever. We don't know what God does in his timing, but God does everything for his glory and for his good. And we continue just to trust in his sovereignty. Regardless of where the official landed, whether he left immediately, whether he left even several days later, we have no idea. But we know that, again, he trusted in the work that Jesus did in the minute that he did it. And the most important thing comes at the very end of 53 here, where it says, he believed and all his household believed. The most significant, the reason why this is so significant, it says the only way his household would have believed him is if the official told them what to believe. Right? He told them of what Jesus had said. He told them of what Jesus promised them, of how Jesus did this miracle for him. The only way that his household believes is because the official tells them about Jesus. 
The father, again, has a huge impact on his family. Again, according to research done by the National Fatherhood Initiative, children with a father in household, they're at a lower risk of emotional and behavioral problems. They're at a lower risk for poor school, poor school performance. They're at a lower risk for criminal activity. And they're at a lower risk for suicide. Whereas children who live in a household without a father, they have a four times higher chance of poverty, a two times higher chance of infant mortality, a two times likelier chance to drop out of school, and a seven times more likely chance of being pregnant as a teenager. Again, a father in the household makes all the difference in the world. Again, in all these statistics, we're looking at the physical side of things, the things in this world that make a difference. But I think what stands out and why this part is so significant is because not only did the father care physically for his son, but then he cares spiritually for his family. Because all the physical things that happen here, these are all temporary things. But bringing your family into faith, giving them and showing them what it means to trust Jesus as your, as your savior, that has an eternal solution. They can't be found anywhere else. And so all three of these things, I think, are characteristics of what make up a godly father. That again, a godly father loves his family, that he sacrifices for his family, that he does anything he can within his own power for his family. That a godly father is filled with faith, that despite all things around, despite whatever else is happening, a godly father trusts in what Jesus says. And lastly, the godly father puts his faith into action, that it isn't just his faith that he has, but it becomes his family's faith. So this Father's Day, take a moment to thank your dad. Take a moment to thank him for the love that he's shown you. Take a moment to thank him for everything that he's passed down to you. Thank him for the faith that he may have passed down to you. Thank him for the sacrifices that he's made for you. Thank him for the countless hours that he's worked for you. And again, maybe your father isn't in the picture. Then continue to look to see, how can I be a better father than my father was before me? How can I continue to be Christ in everything that he's done? And again, continue to know that regardless of how earthly fathers do, we have a heavenly father who has done perfectly in everything, who loves us perfectly so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That our heavenly father, despite how wicked, how evil, how sinful we are, sent his son to die so that we would have the opportunity to enter into heaven by putting our faith in him. So on this Father's Day, we thank our earthly fathers, but most of all, again, we continue to thank our heavenly Father. And at the end of this message, again, my hope and prayer for you is just like the official, that you would come to believe in what Christ has done in your life, and that you would go forth and you would tell not just your family, but then again, you would continue to tell the world of all that Christ has done for you. So with that, let me pray for us as we close out this morning. Father, again, we thank you again just for your love. We thank you for your sacrifice of your son on the cross. We thank you for being the perfect father that none of us here on earth could ever be. My father, we just pray that you would continue to work within us again in whatever situations that we're in. You know, whether we have a father, whether we don't have a father, we have a father in you. And you will always be a good, good father. You will always be one who loves us, who sacrifices for us, who sent his son to die for us. And so, Father, again, we pray that you would just continue to work in us, continue to comfort us when we need it, continue to encourage us when we need it, continue to discipline us when we need it. And again, let us just continue to respond in faith to all that you've done, to continue to love you, your people, and your world, and continue just to make your name known throughout all of it. So, God, we thank you. We do these and pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen.